Hello, hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Algorithms. Today we're starting chapter three about sorting. In chapter two, we had a lot of problems, search problems, variations of search problems such as uniqueness or um, range searching, range counting, range reporting. And all these, the algorithms we discussed for this problem, well, many of the algorithms we task for these problems relied on the input data to already be sorted, to be in increasing or in non-decreasing order, to be somehow pre-processed. And that makes sense. Um, in applications where we have to apply these search problems repeatedly, right? Of course, pre-processing is kind of like an algorithmic investment. We pay a price, a cost, computational cost, running time and memory to pre-process the initial data, such as the input sequence, to make it sorted or to turn it into a range tree. Remember the range trees, the <clears throat> uh, nested trees we discussed for solving uh, range queries, geometric range queries. So this algorithmic investment pays off if and when the search that kind of can harness <clears throat> this pre-processing is applied repeatedly. But how much, how do we do this pre-processing? How much does it cost? And this is what we're going to discuss in chapter three. We're discussing sorting algorithms, basic ones, then more advanced ones, and algorithms for constructing, for example, the range trees that we used in solving the range queries. So that being said, let me power up the slides. And of course, as usual, we follow our paradigm of virtues, specification, clarifying which primitives we're going to use, what is their semantics, what is the cost we charge to the primitives, uh, where there's a, remember this trade-off, simple cost, maybe unit cost one, operation costs one. This is easiest to analyze, but for realistic predictions, one may look more closely and count, for example, the bit operations that take into account the magnitude of the data that is being operated on in the primitives, but this is more involved to analyze. Then we use these primitives to design algorithms and to analyze these algorithms. And the algorithm we're going to discuss in chapter three, sorting, uh, first, yeah, first we will uh, do formal specification of the sorting problem. And then we'll discuss bubble sort. You all know bubble sort. So my goal here is to uh, provide you with a new perspective of the sorting algorithms according to the virtues, selection sort, insertion sort, merge sort, the usual suspects, quick sort, and quick sort will turn out to be not as quick as it's commonly perceived, because in the worst case, it is as bad as bubble sort quadratic running time, unless we uh, uh, add a special sophisticated means for choosing the pivot where the quick sort recursive um, splits the array. And this is where our linear time median comes uh, into account that we discussed in section two, searching. Then we're going to prove optimality of uh, sorting algorithms. Then we're going to prove that indeed, um, for example, merge sort and quick sort with this pivoting both are indeed optimal. Any sorting algorithm uh, requires at least n log n steps. And this is a very powerful, if you think about it, a very powerful statement. It says something about any possible algorithm, even those that uh, nobody has come up with yet. But the underlying well ended uh, is some, also some beautiful applications of mathematics, of combinatorics. 
Uh, but underlying that proof is the hypothesis that the algorithms are comparison based. And I will explain to you what that means. And then we'll remove that restriction. We will deliberately start devising, analyzing, designing, and analyzing algorithms that are not comparison based and thus can beat this lower bound and enable us to sort in linear time. But as usual, there's a caveat to it, namely <clears throat> uh, sorting in linear time, provided that we only count the number of operations and uh, disregard the magnitude of the data being sorted. Um, so we're going to talk about, um, 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 for example, radix sort. And then we close with uh, algorithms that sort in parallel, parallel computing paradigms. There's an entire lecture on parallel computing. So this is just kind of a, um, uh, to give you a taste of this uh, uh, later advanced lecture kind of cross promotion. And that's where we end chapter three. So that being said, let's uh, let's now um, uh, start and recall the specification of uh, <clears throat> the sorting problem formalized. Right? So intuitively, everybody knows what uh, sorting is about, but uh, our purpose is really to make this formal. So <clears throat> make it. Let's make it formal. Input is a finite sequence of n elements where n is also part of the input, the length of sequence, elements from an arbitrary set with a total order, right? Total order. Um, there are also starting problems that do not use a total order, but uh, that uh, uh, goes beyond the purpose of this introductory lecture. And as I said, uh, the applications of sorting or sorting itself is one of the many <clears throat> kinds of uh, pre-processing um, uh, algorithmic investment in order to accelerate future um, queries or future, for example, search problems. And uh, if that investment, whether that investment does pay off, that depends on um, uh, exactly um, how much it costs, right? So we're going to need to analyze the cost of sorting algorithms. So there's going to be kind of break even point. So what is the output of uh, sorting? The output is a permuted array. So a permutation of the initial array that is in non-decreasing order. So this is one variant of specifying the sorting problem. The output should be the sorted array. Okay, we will discuss a variant of that specification where the output is the permutation itself. This is a subtle difference, right? It could make a difference, but the algorithms we consider actually provide both the permuted array and the permutation. And knowing the permutation is maybe arguably uh, enough or, uh, because if we know the permutation, then it remains just to apply the permutation, which takes linear time to get the permuted array. So maybe uh, most important question is to find such a permutation and that permutation need not be unique. If there are repeated entries, then uh, we can kind of uh, flip two entries that are equal without changing the order, right? So that's our problem specification and the operations we're going to use is well, as usual, ordered comparison between two given two indices into the array, compare the two elements at these positions. We'll also employ some integer arithmetic on these indices. And we'll use one swapping operation. So we don't really consider assignments, assigning uh, value to an entry in the array. Uh, using only swapping that all met, uh, makes sure that the result will be a permutation, right? Whereas if we assign some element to X of M, then that assignment could, when applied carelessly, could violate the, could create a non-permutation, could create repeated entries or could override, could uh, remove entries from the input array. But uh, as long as we only stick to swapping, then, uh, then we're good, then it's going to create a permutation and observe 
the correspondence to discrete mathematics where we prove, where it's known that every permutation is, uh, can be represented as a composition, as a sequence of such uh, swapping operations. These are um, uh, <clears throat> um, to called transpositions in discrete mathematics. So again, obviously there's a close connection between algorithms and mathematics. Here we call it swapping. In mathematics, it's called a transposition. So in a sense, this is a kind of a, uh, the goal to calculate a transposition decomposition of a permutation that makes the input array sorted. Right, did I convey a new perspective on the sorting problem that you may or may not have been aware of before? Well, that's my purpose here. That's my goal in this introductory course because you all know the sorting problem. So uh, yes, and as I said, we will occasionally also consider the variant of the sorting problem where the output is to, supposed to be a permutation itself, not the sorted array, but a permutation which does sort turn the array into a sorted one. And for that purpose, we don't swap entries in the array. Uh, instead, we uh, use the operation of swapping to entries uh, in, the, in, the, in the permutation that is adding kind of a, a one transposition to the transposition decomposition of the permutation. So, and for that uh, purpose, our algorithm will also use some kind of a initial, uh, for the latter purpose, some initial permutation initialized to be the identity permutation. And then throughout the course of the algorithm, um, it will apply these, swapping these transpositions to this uh, um, initially identity permutation, such that at the end, the resulting permutation sorts the input data. So yeah, let's keep that in mind. And now we start as promised and as always at the beginning of a new chapter, we start very simple, very easy uh, by discussing bubble sort. You all know bubble sort. So uh, let's not uh, delve into too deep into it. Um, you know, the two nested loops, right? And uh, here we consider the case where the outer loop goes down from n to two, and the inner loop goes up from one to m minus one, right? We only need to uh, uh, look at the elements. Uh, the elements from m up to n are uh, already being sorted. That's kind of the loop invariant of the outer loop. I'll say it again, the loop invariant of the outer loop is that the <clears throat> entries from position m to position n are already sorted and the inner loop then climbs up um, to takes care of the remaining elements and bubbles up the largest element to then arrive at position uh, n minus one and thus uh, allows for the induction step now to decrease small m. And how does that bubbling up work? Uh, the inner loop compares two adjacent elements at position k and k plus one. And if they're in the right order already, nothing is to be done. If they're wrong order, swap them. This is the swapping operation that I mentioned before. Yes, and observe that indeed we use some basic in index, uh, integer index arithmetic name increment and decrement here. So yeah, nothing uh, interesting happening here, you know, all, all the running time. So, but as a small exercise kind of a towards, remember one of the uh, um, virtues of computer science is to uh, assert correctness of the algorithm and uh, for example, formal correctness proof often use loop invariants and the loop invariant used here is uh, that uh, after each iteration of the outer loop, the elements uh, on positions one up to M are all less or equal than the elements at positions M plus one up to N and the elements at position M plus one up to N are already sorted. And these are not necessarily yet sorted. And uh, please do take the time to uh, verify, to prove by induction. The induction uh, start is easy, right? When n is 
m is equal to n, then the left part is empty and the initial part is trivial. Uh, but uh, the induction step that one after one iteration, then one execution of the inner loop, then indeed uh, we can move from m to m minus one and still had to satisfy the loop invariant. And thus at the end of the outer loop, when m has reached two, then it is true that uh, x1, um, right after the end of the loop, m is equal to one. And thus um, the loop invariant says that everything is then sorted. Okay. Yes, so exercise, um, formal correctness proof, Runheim is quadratic. And here you see an example execution of the uh, bubble sort on this uh, initial array of uh, eight elements. Um, this is the outer loop executed once, comparing adjacent elements. And if they're in the wrong position, they are swapped. And uh, yeah, you get the idea, right? So let's try that again. Um, yes. OK, so that was bubble sort. Yeah, nothing uh, interesting happening here. So um, let's now move on. Oh, yes, here's the video. Okay, oh, moving on. Um, quadratic running time, um, is that optimal? Okay, or can we do better? Here's a different sorting algorithm called select sort. What's the basic idea underlying select sort? In a select sort, um, we start <clears throat> uh, and first uh, locate the minimum element, the least element according to the total order, um, among the remaining elements. And then we put that least element at the uh, position with index M. So first we find among all elements, the least one, this is uh, this inner loop, right? Um, if we find one that is strictly smaller than the one we have so far located as minimum element, then we record that, or rather we record its index, its position. And after execution of the inner loop, this uh, inner element, least element is then replaced or swapped uh, with the element at position M, which is initially the first position. And then we repeat the same with the M increased and so thus locate the second least element and then put that at position two. Then the third lead element and put that at position three and so on. So that's select sort. And uh, again, correctness is easy. I really urge you to um, prove that for only two state um, uh, loop invariant, and then prove by induction that the loop invariant remains through, true throughout the execution. And here you see an example execution, right? So the yellow part is the uh, <clears throat> elements that are already at the correct position. And then we see the, uh, uh, the loop running through. Uh, let's start again, right? So the blue part looks for least element and red is the current least element until a smaller element is found. And then it is at the end it's replaced uh, with a position, right? So that's an example execution of a, um, a select sort. And here's the loop in where, oh, so we don't even need to look for the loop in around. And again, the running time is uh, obviously quadratic because it's two nested loops, right? So again, nothing interesting, moving on. Insert sort, how about insert sort? Um, the idea of insert sort is uh, to um, insert uh, uh, elements. So we kind of uh, shift up and down the array uh, at the position where an element needs to be inserted. Inserting in arrays is a costly operation because we have to move all other elements up and uh, simply similarly removing 
and entry is costly because we have to move all other elements down. So here you see an execution of the insertion sort. So here we want to insert four uh, at the right position and thus have to move all other elements, uh, elements up until the position where four needs to go. And uh, in this example execution, execution, this is already done. So once again, starting from scratch. So um, we go through the uh, <clears throat> array and when <clears throat> there's a mismatch, then we insert that at the uh, correct position. That's what you see happening here. And uh, observe that technically this is a violation of our swapping condition, right? But uh, it's easy to express that as a swapping. Um, so yeah, uh, repeated swapping, so don't worry about that. Insert sort um, um, correctness, here you see loop invariant. Um, um, yeah, so here's, yes, uh, like in, in uh, previous sort, uh, the, it's the pre initial part that is already sorted and the uh, last part is the one that remains to be sorted. Um, and the running time is also obvious quadratic two nested loops here. It's the outer loop and here the inner loop um, starts with uh, n minus one and then gets decremented in each execution until k uh, reaches zero. So quadratic running time boring. And um, moving on. Yes, yeah, so now we've seen three, three quadratic time algorithms. What's the, what's the point of them? Our goal, remember, is to find a subquadratic one. And this is now finally where we're heading at merge sort. Merge sort uh, is the following. So <clears throat> we kind of uh, split the array <clears throat> into two parts. And the first part we um, put into uh, one array Y. And the second part we put into another array Z. And uh, then we recursively sort the first part and the second part. And then that's why it's called merge sort. We merge the two sorted parts, right? So Y has roughly half the size, right? If the size is an odd number, we need to round up and down. But we mentioned that <clears throat> Y and Z are roughly uh, half of the original array. We recursively sort each half by itself. But then uh, we need to merge the two parts because there could be elements in Y that are greater than elements in Z and there could be elements in Y that are smaller than elements in Z. So this is the real the work ho uh, horse of merge sort. Uh, we gradually walk through the two now sorted, individually separately sorted arrays, right? And uh, then depending on which one is smaller, if the Z is smaller, then uh, <clears throat> we put that element at the current position in the original array. Otherwise, we put the other uh, <clears throat> element <clears throat> at the current position in the array and decrease the, the counter, right? So observe that here we proceed from right, in merging, we proceed from right to left, from uh, top to down, right? So these loops go up from one to these positions. But this uh, loop now uh, looks at the sorted array starting at the right position, right end of Y and at the right end of Z array. So we need to look for the largest element. And if the largest element is in the Y array, then that gets stored at the current position in the original array. And we move left one step in the Y array, otherwise, uh, if the largest element of the two is in Z array, then we put that element into the uh, output array and decrease uh, uh, the right end of the uh, Z uh, array index. <clears throat> then there's some bookkeeping to be done um, when either one of the two, but not both conditions satisfied. Uh, are violated, then the while loops um, terminate, and then we need to copy the remaining elements from whichever ever array was left uh, is left over y or z to the remainder of x. 
and that's uh, uh, yeah one of the two conditions. That's what happening here, and here you see an example execution, right? So here we have two already sorted subarrays, this one and this one, and now they have been merged to make one sorted resulting array. Let's look at this once again. Let's start over. So here's the original array. Um, we split it into two parts. Recursively split these into two parts, then sort each part, which is now trivial since they're one element parts, and then merge the two element parts separately, merge these two element parts separately, merge these two element parts separately and merge these two element parts separately and then merge the pairs, right? Of the first subarray and then merge the, these two And finally, merge these two uh, arrays to result in the sorted array. Yeah, you see the recursion working here, right? First, entirely down to the bottom to one element arrays, right? Uh, if we're sorting a one element array, then nothing is to be done. And otherwise, um, um, <clears throat> Recurs. So yes, that's merge sort. And now we want to analyze the computational cost of merge sort. And this is... Right, so here's the recurrence for this recursive algorithm. Uh, that's the benefit of recursive algorithms. We can easily analyze their running time by setting up a recurrence and then applying the um, um, master theorem. So the algorithm makes two recursive calls, right? Here are the two recursive calls. Each one to sub arrays of half the size, right? Round it down or round it up. It's a minor detail. So two recursive call to arrays of half the size plus linear overhead for creating these two subarrays, right? So here, this loop and this loop split the original array into the two subarrays. And then there's a bookkeeping for the merging part, which is also linear time. There are two, uh, the two arrays or uh, subarrays are processed. And in each iteration of the loop, one uh, counter gets incremented and the sum of the two counters, L and R, uh, together uh, is equal to the initial size capital N. So uh, that this loop is executed at most N times. And if it takes less, then the final bookkeeping here covers the remaining elements. So to summarize, uh, we have linear overhead for the preparation. We have linear overhead for the merging phase. And then in the middle of both, we have the two recursive calls to sort uh, subarrays of half the size. So that's a recurrence and then uh, the master theorem kicks in and says um, that this running time is n log n. So we have found our first n log n algorithm for sorting, right? Well, you already knew such algorithm, but this one is a re rigorous and real analysis n log n with beaten the quadratic time uh, of the previous three algorithms, um, um, merge sort uh, is faster than, um, um, than bubble sort. And the memory overhead is, uh, uh, yeah, there's a memory overhead. That's uh, maybe an, a disadvantage of uh, merge sort. The previous algorithms all were in sorting in, uh, in place using the input array. So they were linear memory, uh, used linear amount of memory, but here this algorithm uses additional arrays, right? And they uses additional arrays on each level of the recursion, right? So when making the recursive call, the algorithm will in turn 
create and initialize these arrays, okay? And that, that is costly, right? Um, that costs, <coughs> um, um, and the de recursion depth is logarithmic because in each recursive level, the algorithm uses half the, um, um, uh, uh, half, half the size of the array. So there's a memory overhead of factor log n here, and that's a disadvantage. That means we should now move on and look for algorithms which have subquadratic running time and hopefully linear memory. And now let's uh, look at the famous quicksort here. Here's the quicksort algorithm. And this is a kind of also recursive algorithm, but it uh, operates in place. It uses only the existing input array. So let's uh, look at that. And here's an important operation in quicksort. Well, there's the initial K K check, right? So if L, uh, so the, right, the specification is uh, to sort uh, not the entire array X, but the part from position L to position R. These are indices. And uh, after it returns, uh, it must have that part sorted. Now, the induction start is if L is greater or equal to R, then there's nothing to do. We already sorted, it's only one element. Otherwise, we're going to um, make a recursive uh, call like with merge sort previously. But uh, uh, we do that in this uh, sequence here. And this, uh, we split the array and merge sort would split the array simply in half um, at the middle position index. The difference with quicksort is that quicksort splits the array according to the value. Okay, let me say that again. A merge sort would split the array um, at the middle of the array, at the middle index, whereas quicksort splits the array at, according to the value, not the index. Not, um, and it does that in the following way. <clears throat> it uh, looks at all, uh, it chooses a certain element as this is the so-called pivot. And we'll discuss uh, on the next slide how to choose that pivot in a, smart way, uh, but once the pivot is chosen, uh, Quicksort compares every element in the original array to that pivot. And if the element at that position has value this than the pivot, then it goes to the left subarray. And if it has value larger than the, or equal to the pivot, then it goes to the right subarray. And uh, these subarrays, that's the point here, are not additional subarrays, but they remain in place. So this is uh, the condition. If it's already at the right position, uh, right subarray, then there's nothing to do. And otherwise, um, the two elements are swapped so that at the end um, of this uh, uh, loop, some of you might remember that from, from our um, linear time medium algorithm, this is a this is a so-called splitting operation. We take a value S, and this, or sometimes called Y, and all entries that are less than it are uh, swapped to the left part of the interval uh, of the array, and all elements greater are swapped to the right part. And uh, where does S end up itself in that array? That's where the, that's, that index is now not necessarily in the middle of the array. Um, it depends on S, right? So um, we're going to discuss that when we <clears throat> analyze the uh, runtime of that algorithm. So, and after this, having <clears throat> split the array into the first part uh, at position uh, L, um, uh, no, at position A, contain the elements smaller than S, and the second part contains the elements larger than S, then quicksort also makes two recursive calls, like with the merge sort, but now it does so in place. That's the benefit in memory. The disadvantage is 
this splitting is now not necessarily a 50-50 split. It depends on how the pivot was chosen. If the pivot is kind of small, then the first uh, part of the array is, uh, uh, is very short, and then A is very small, and the second part is large, which results in an unbalanced recurse. And conversely, if S happens to be very large, then the second part of the array turns out to be very long and the first part short, which means um, that uh, uh, again we have an unbalanced recurrence here. Uh, so here's you see the recurrence uh, to sort n elements. Quick sort has a linear overhead, right? And observe that we don't need any bookkeeping after the two recursive calls. There is no final merge phase necessary because we already have made sure initially that all elements in the first half, uh, in the first part of the array are smaller than the elements in the second part. So after having sorted the first and second part individually, we already have a sorted array, no um, bookkeeping after the recursive calls, but uh, the cost of the recursive calls depends on how the pivot was chosen depends on uh, the length of the two subarrays, and that is hard to predict initially, right? So, for example, some one might choose the middle element in the array, but there's nothing, no telling whether the element in the middle is also <clears throat> results in a kind of balance split. Could happen that the element in the middle is the smallest element, in which case the left array here happens to be well, basically empty, right? Um, let me say that again, if the element in the middle is the smallest element, that could happen, right? We have an unsorted array as input after all, then that means that after the splitting phase, the first uh, array part of the array is just one this one single element and there's the first recursive call does nothing and the second recursive call uh, needs to do all the work and uh, uh, or we could uh, choose as pivot the left end of the interval to be sorted or the right end uh, or whatever how do we choose the pivot and if it, the pivot has bad uh, splitting properties splits the array in balance right you see that this is the then that means that the, the position of the after the splitting is imbalanced uh, either to the right or to, to the left and uh, so this is uh, in this case the recur first recursive call takes constant time and the second recursive call has to sort all elements except for the uh, least or the largest one. So that's a very bad recurrence. And if you solve it using the math theorem, it results in quadratic running time. Um, so that means quick sort is in the worst case, very bad, as bad as bubble sort. And this worst cases indeed to occur. Uh, we have seen such cases where, for example, uh, each choice of pivot can we can construct um, count example bad case where the pivot uh, is uh, results in an imbalance split. Maybe the pivot is a little bit better than uh, we have two elements in the uh, left subarray and n minus one in the remain, but still the running time is quadratic. Um, one choice uh, one might come up with, how about taking a random pivot, but uh, uh, that has two disadvantages. First, now we're talking about randomized algorithm, which is an entirely different subject of its own. There are entire courses on randomized algorithms, which I can highly recommend, but they go far beyond the purpose of this introductory course. And also, um, also random element could be a bad pivot, right? It's uh, maybe hopefully it's unlikely, but it's possible. So from the perspective of worst case runtime analysis, also random pivots are uh, kind of bad. So yeah, we're not going to talk about randomized algorithms here. We're not going to analyze uh, randomized pivot, but instead, um, yeah, what do we want? We want some bounded, well, we don't, uh, of course, optimal would be a 50-50 split, right? 50-50, uh, 
then we have the same recurrence as with merge sort, but without the memory overhead. We don't have the memory overhead of merge sort here. 50-50 um, split would be desirable, uh, but uh, we can relax that a little bit. Uh, for example, instead of 50-50, also 40-60 will still result in a recurrence that has logarithmic solution according to the master theorem. Or 30-70, 30-70 is also good, as long as it's a constant ratio, bounded ratio. Um, 50-50, 40-60, 30-70, only one and n minus one, that's uh, or constant and n minus constant. So it should be a constant ratio instead of a constant offset in the recurrence. And then we arrive at n log n running time. The constant in the n log n, of course, will get worse. 50-50 is the smallest constant, 30-70 uh, is a little bit larger constant, but remember we're focusing on asymptotics and thus ignore the constant. So uh, long story short, we need some constant ratio uh, in the split. And how do we, uh, that's, uh, that's a formalization of having constant ratio, epsilon is the ratio here. And how do we uh, arrive at that, right? So then, Epsilon ratio is the first subinterval, and one minus epsilon ratio is the second subinterval. And if you solve that using the master theorem, then it results in n log n with a constant here hidden that depends on epsilon. But as long as epsilon is a constant, then we're good. So our goal is to find a pivot element that has a constant ratio between left and right. Okay, epsilon arbitrary but fixed away from zero and away from one. Um, and here you see how to solve that recurrence because technically this uh, recurrence is not covered by the master theorem because it has two different uh, recursive calls. So here you see the mathematics for solving that recurrence. Um, but uh, I want to skip over that and leave that to discrete mathematics course. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so as long as epsilon is fixed, the uh, uh, resulting growth is n log n. Okay, so how can we find the pivot that splits between left and right part in a, with a bounded ratio? And uh, that's where we get back now to our approximate median algorithm from chapter two, right? Uh, remember, our proximate median algorithm does exactly that, right? Uh, it provides um, an approximation a position a pivot, which has some, somewhere between 30 and 50, 70 percent elements smaller, and by symmetry also 70 to 30 percent elements larger. So this is exactly uh, what we need with L epsilon equal to 30% or 70% doesn't uh, make a difference in the asymptotics. And so since we discussed that uh, in the last uh, um, chapter, let me just briefly remind you how to calculate such an approximate median as a pivot for to be used in quicksort. And uh, one way of doing that is using the median of five medians. And this is a linear time algorithm and then Please solve the recurrence uh, for quicksort. Uh, now, taking into account that here, this big O of n then additionally covers the time for calculating the approximate median, right? When we use the approximate median, then this uh, is a linear time median, and this takes additional linear time. So that's why it's important to here have a linear overhead. If we have overhead n log n here, then it becomes a different recurrence and the quicksort does not have running time n log n, but n times log squared. So that's why it's so important that we have the uh, linear time approximate median or exact median that's even better, but asymptotically it doesn't make any difference. And somebody asked, why do we choose the median of five medians, not the median of, for example, three medians? And uh, hint, hint, this is, this is the answer. This is the reason why we use the median of five medians. OK. 
Okay. So yeah, just to for you to remember that. Um, and here's the algorithm. Actually, the two algorithms that mutually call each other, and they proceed like this. Okay. So um, um, long story short, quick sort without sophisticated chase of, of the pivot has quadratic worst case running time. Then there's randomized quick sort beyond the purpose of this lecture. And then there is a um, um, quick sort using the approximate or the uh, uh, exact median, which has a worst case running time n log n. And that's uh, as good as merge sort, but without the memory overhead. And that's why um, uh, Tony Hoare, the inventor of quicksort, became so famous because uh, quicksort is uh, uh, n log n worst case running time and linear memory. So this is really optimal, as we shall see um, soon. Yeah, because now we proceed to optimality. But first, let's make take a short break here. Uh, to allow for questions and discussions in the chat. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your questions and, and, and the online chat. And uh, there's a, a great question about how is quick sort quicker than other sort? And that's a great question because it is not. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a much more subtle, right? So, as we saw, quick sort is actually as bad as, for example, bubble sort in the worst case, if unless the pivot is chosen in a smart way. Any uh, simple way of choosing the pivot, like choosing the middle element of the array, as you uh, recall here, right? So here, this example chooses the middle ele uh, element of the array as pivot. But that results in the worst case in a bad behavior if that middle element happens to be the smallest element, or if that middle element happens to be the largest element, or even if it's second smallest or second largest or third smallest, third largest. In all these cases, quick sort is as bad as bubble sort quadratic running time, very bad behavior, right? So that's the first answer to the question whether quick sort is quicker than other sort. And it's not. The second answer is um, even with the good choice of pivot, like the linear time median or approximate median, quick sort is still not quicker than, for example, merge sort. Merge sort also has guaranteed n log n, and quick sort with this small choice of pivot also has n log n running time, not at all quicker than merge sort. However, the benefit of quick sort over merge sort is that it uses a linear amount of memory, whereas merge sort uses has a logarithmic overhead. It uses n log n memory. So uh, that's uh, yeah, that's the really the benefit of asymptotic analysis, right? So you can and I did actually in my youth I did tweak quick sort to make it faster, but only by a constant factor and thus. Uh, uh, not making any uh, real progress, but now using uh, the asymptotic analysis of memory and runtime, we can rigorously compare all these sorting algorithms and we can state and answer your excellent question whether and in what sense quick sort is better than other sorting algorithms. So that's uh, one great question. Another great question asks about uh, the running time of median of five medians. Um, right, that's a great question, but I'm not going to answer that, but leave it to you because that's one of the, uh, I think, one of the homework assignments. Um, then there's a question about the constant hidden. I understand the question asked. Um, it seems a rigorous implementation of Quicksort uses a lot of primitive operations. Would it affect the actual running time, uh, for example, to select a pivot? And that's indeed true. So this choice of pivot that you see here, 
costs one step, right? It's a very simple operation. But for uh, n log n running time quick sort, we need to replace that single operation with a call to the approximate or to the linear time median. So that simple one assignment is going to repl replace by O of n linear number of primitive operations, which is, of course, much more. And asymptotically, we made sure we took care that it still covers by the uh, linear overhead that we did anyway, and thus results in a n log n asymptotic running time, but the constant uh, becomes, of course, much larger than with a simple pivot choice. But with a simple pivot choice, there's no guaranteed n log n. So there's a kind of trade-off here. Um, and uh, that's, uh, uh, remember the saying of Donald Knuth, um, premature optimization is the root of all evil, or put differently, now that we have found an asymptotically optimal algorithm, as we will prove on the next slide, now it's time to look for uh, optimization uh, for reducing the constant factor here. But only now, that's a different uh, realm of computer science. It's uh, called uh, algorithm engineering. And again, that goes beyond the purpose of this current uh, course. So thank you very much for this question. It's so good a question that I could only partially answer it and recommend you um, take a dedicated course, for example, on algorithm uh, engineering. And now we're going to move on and prove that uh, uh, n log n is actually optimal running time for sorting. So here you see the question of optimality, the last of the virtues of, uh, of computer science um, being applied to the question of sorting. And uh, we're going to prove that comparison-based sorting indeed requires asymptotically n log n operations. And this is where our um, virtue of specifying the primitives and the cost comes into uh, play again, namely we're going to really use that our algorithms only can use such com comparisons, comparison-based sorting. Um, and in this way, we will, this will allow us to argue about all possible algorithms, uh, which is a very strong statement and it's a mathematical statement um, and uh, with a rigorous proof that I'm going to present you. So, uh, please stay tuned and also observe that we have gradually moved up in uh, difficulty uh, from the beginning of the chapter to this uh, uh, optimality, which is uh, mostly uh, mathematics, discrete mathematics and combinatorics. So first, a mathematical decision uh, definition. A decision tree for sorting n elements is a binary tree whose nodes are labeled with formal comparisons like statements is x of i less or equal to x of j, where i and j are specific numbers. x, remember, is the input array, so that's a variable, but every node must have a specific value uh, of i and j. I'm going to give you an example, right? So here you see an example of a decision tree, and here you see comparing, well, here the elements are called A instead of X, but that shouldn't distract you. So here we're comparing X of one with X of two. If it's less, then the decision tree moves to the left. If it's greater, then the decision tree proceeds to the right. That's a semantics. I'm going to formalize the semantics. Here's another example of an internal node being labeled with such a comparison. Here's the comparison between second and third element. This internal node is labeled with a comparison with the first, first and third element. So here is I, I is one, J is three here also, and here I is two and J is three. <clears throat> That's the internal nodes. How about the leaves? The leaves are supposed to be labeled with permutations. And indeed, here you see a permutation. That's the identity permutation. And here you see some other permutation. This, for example, means 
for, uh, one gets mapped to two, two gets mapped to three, and three gets mapped to one. That's a permutation of one, two, three permutations. So instead, on every input, uh, every input ends up in a leaf. What does it mean with ending up? It means initially, imagine this to be a kind of a, uh, a kind of a decision uh, procedure, right? So uh, initially, A is the input array. If the element at position one is less or equal to the element at position two, then the semantics of the tree means proceed to the left, otherwise proceed to the right, and so on. Walk through the uh, tree until uh, down, 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 until ending up in a leaf. And the leaf must satisfy by the definition that the, um, that the permutation in this leaf must sort the input data, meaning that initial, uh, uh, the, the uh, yeah, it must, that's the precise terminology, right? That's what our condition, uh, our specification, and that's what the decision tree must do. It must return basically in its leaves, different permutations such that in each leaf, the right permutation is the one, uh, the permutation in each leaf is the one that uh, sorts the, uh, the input array. And I want you to verify that this is the case for this decision tree. Let me give you one example, okay? Let's consider uh, the simple case where the input array already is sorted. So let's suppose that the input array is one, two, three, A1 is one, A2 is two, A3 is three. What does that uh, mean here? The first comparison here compares A1 to A2. A1 is one, A2 is two, so it proceeds to the left. Then it compares A2 to A3. A2 is less or equal, then it uh, proceeds to the left. And now it is in um, uh, leaf and the permutation, there's the identity permutation and indeed the identity permutation sorts the uh, sorted input array. So this condition is satisfied and please you verify that also all other possible cases, the leaf where this decision tree ends up in sorts the input uh, uh, array. This is a, thus a decision tree after we verify that this is a decision tree for sorting three elements. If you want to sort four elements, you're gonna need a different decision tree. There are, various, there are more decision trees for sorting three elements than this one. This is just one example. Uh, there are decision trees for sorting four elements and so on. Many decision trees, um, but uh, one for each size n. And now why is this a, a relevant uh, definition? First of all, this is now a formalized mathematical object. The decision tree is a mathematical object that we can argue about formally. And secondly, we will see that these decision trees arise from um, comparison-based sorting algorithms. Comparison-based sorting algorithms um, can be converted to decision trees. And then we're going to prove mathematical statements about decision trees and thus arrive at statements about any comparison-based sorting algorithm. Here we go. Right, I've already given, oh, here's another example. Uh, great animation. If the input array is two, three, one, then it proceeds in that way and then arrives at this uh, leaf and observe that this leaf sorts the input array. Um, um, yeah, because uh, yeah, it's the inverse permutation if you like. So yeah, moving on. Uh, this is a mathematical statement that connects sorting-based algorithm and decision trees, and then make statement about decision trees. The first part says, as long as n, the input array the size is fixed, then we can convert any comparison-based uh, sorting algorithm of running time t of n into a decision tree for sorting n elements of depth t of n. So that's uh, what I announced. The relevance of decision trees is that comparison-based sorting algorithms can be converted into decision tree. One, uh, two. So we fix n and then on the roll, the algorithm 
into such a decision tree for sorting n elements. For different choice, the same algorithm gives rise to a different decision tree, but any such decision tree has depth at most the running time of the algorithm. And uh, yeah, this is uh, basically uh, proven by symbolic execution of the comparison-based sorting algorithm. You may know that symbolic execution is a common uh, strategy for uh, proving uh, correctness, uh, program, program uh, verification. And this is kind of a, a toy example, first example, uh, symbolic execution for converting comparison-based sorting algorithms into decision trees. I'm not going to become more formal here um, and since then move on to the second uh, claim of this lemma, uh, namely mathematical properties of these decision trees. Namely every permutation, if we uh, want to sort a permutation of n elements, then it ends up in the unique leaf with label inverse permutation. And you see that this is the case here, right? So for example, this is a permutation one gets mapped to two, and uh, two um, gets mapped to one according to the permutation in the leaf. How about two? Two gets mapped to this one, to three, and three gets mapped to two according to the permutation in the leaf. Three gets mapped to one in the input permutation and one gets mapped back to three. So this is indeed the inverse permutation to this permutation. And this is no coincidence because according to the second item in the lemma, this is always true. Every permutation ends up in the unique leaf with label inverse permutation. If we have repeated elements, if the input is not a permutation, then uh, something different can happen. It can it need not be unique. But if the input is a permutation, then there's a unique leaf where the end with the label. So that's the second. Uh, statement, the second claim about uh, uh, decision trees. And the third decision, uh, statement is that any binary tree with uh, n factorially many leaves has depth at least the logarithm of n vectorial. So let me say that again. Um, so um, what we do know is, of course, that uh, any binary tree with uh, m leaves has at least log m depth, right? Because in each uh, level, being a binary tree, the number of nodes on each level can at most double on each level. So in order to reach depth n factorial, we need at least depth log n factorial, binary logarithm. And then comes Sterling, which says the logarithm of n factorial is n log n. So this is a purely mathematical statement. Um, namely Sterling's uh, theorem. And uh, yeah, now it remains to put all these th three claims together. Um, I've given you proof of the second and third. And the first one is basically symbolic execution. And put them together, we arrive at the famous uh, statement that any comparison-based sorting algorithm requires at least n log n uh, running time, at least n log n operations. Why? That follows now from this combining these lemmas, right? Uh, items. Let me first, we take the comparison based sorting algorithm. We then convert that into a decision tree according to item A, whose depth is the same as the running time. According to item B, that decision tree must have at least one different leaf for every possible input permutation. All right, let me say that again. The decision tree must have at least one distinct leaf for each input permutation, because every input result leaves, uh, ends up in a leaf whose label is its inverse permutation. So different input permutations end up in different leaves. And, uh, so we must have at least as many leaves as their input permutations. How many input permutations are there? N factorial, right? You learned that in combinatorics, discrete mathematics, there are at least N factorially many input permutations. And according to item C, that means that the depth of this decision tree, which recall item A is uh, the running time of the original algorithm, 
um, the depth of that decision tree must be at least uh, n log n, and thus the original algorithm's running time must be at least n log n. And that proves our theorem. And thus uh, we um, um, have reached really a, um, uh, uh, a landmark in uh, design and analysis of algorithms. Namely, we could formally prove optimality of comparison based sorting algorithms using. Uh, pretty <clears throat> elegant machinery from discrete mathematics. And uh, thus we have been able to prove optimality of merge sort and of quick sort with uh, linear time median. We cannot beat running time n log n. So to summarize today's lecture, we first formalized the, um, we first formalized um, the, the semantics, uh, the problem specification of sorting, where the output is a, a, a permutation. We discussed the primitives to be used, namely mostly swapping and comparison. And then we discussed some simple algorithms, bubble sort, uh, insertion sort. All these had quadratic running time. And then we finally found a first uh, uh, subquadratic time algorithm, namely a merge sort, um, which uh, we recursive sorting, which we proved to have running time n log n, but has a disadvantage of being having also n log n memory. There's an overhead. And then we discussed quick sort, which uh, um, whose running time we saw depends crucially on how the pivot is chosen. If we choose the pivot in a smart way using the approximate or maybe the, in the exact median algorithm, then quick sort does have running time n log n. Otherwise, it uh, in the worst case, it's as bad as bubble sort. But with this choice of pivot, it uh, becomes uh, competitive in running time to merge sort, but uh, superior in terms of memory use to merge sort. Then we quick sort then has linear memory use. And finally, we proved that uh, concerning the running time, n log n is optimal quick sort and uh, merge sort cannot be beaten as comparison-based sorting algorithm. And the next time we're going to uh, discuss non-comparison-based sorting algorithms, but that's all for today and for now. Thank you very much for your attentions and for your questions and see you next time.